Okay, so my name is Jonathan Layton. Uh, I've written two books about ethics, most recently a book called The Tango of Ethics, Intuition, Rationality, and the Prevention of Suffering, which is really the development of a framework for thinking about ethics that puts in question some of the traditional ways of thinking, in particular classical utilitarianism, and really directs our attention towards the primacy of suffering in our ethical priorities. And aside from writing books, I run a small organization, we call it a think and do tank, called OPUS, which is the Organization for the Prevention of Intense Suffering. And the whole uh, rationale behind OPUS is to make the prevention of intense suffering of all sentient beings, humans and animals, a top priority of a compassionate society. And with Opus, we're focusing really on two levels. One is the more, uh, the more narrow level of addressing very specific causes of suffering and offering solutions and advocating for these solutions. So specifically, we've been working on uh, access to morphine, uh, specifically for uh, terminal cancer patients in lower income countries, especially in Africa and other parts of the world, where something that we take for granted in, uh, in rich countries is just not available for the vast majority of the population. So that's something that we, that was one of the first cause areas that we got into. And more recently, we've been working on cluster headaches, which is one of the most excruciating pains known to medicine. It turns out that several psychedelics, um, including psilocybin, LSD, and DMT, are dramatically effective in either preventing or even aborting attacks. And, uh, of course, these substances are all illegal in most jurisdictions, and that's something that we're trying to address uh, by um, basically by informing people about the reality of cluster headaches and advocating for change in, uh, in regulations or uh, legislation to make sure that patients can actually access these medications. When somebody is suffering, that suffering becomes all-encompassing, especially if we're talking about severe or extreme suffering. So, you know, many people know from personal experience, especially people who have gone through this kind of suffering, how in that moment nothing else matters. And there's this sort of visceral understanding of just how important it is in that moment. So it becomes, it's obvious in the moment and it becomes less obvious when we're no longer experiencing it or when we're talking about other people's suffering. It's something that we might forget about or that we, um, we just get distracted by other things. So it's really more a matter of where we focus our attention. Um, it's very easy to forget about suffering that we've experienced in the past, almost as if we're a third-person observer. But in the moment, we really understand why it's so essential that extreme and unbearable suffering be treated with the utmost seriousness and that we do everything we can to, to relieve it. Um, it's really only through, only because of a sense of detachment from others, from other suffering, that we can ignore it. We don't even have, we don't need to know exactly how suffering is pr produced, you know, at the level of the, the brain's anatomy and physiology. Um, I mean, it's important, of course, at the level of, um, of medication and, you know, understanding the mechanisms by which medications act so that we can develop better medications. Uh, you know, for example, with cluster headaches, it would be really important to know exactly how these psychedelics work. You know, we know that they act on serotonin receptors, but we don't know exactly how they, um, how they alleviate the entire condition. But, you know, just at the level of ethics, um, it's just the experience that matters and, and not so much what happens, you know, behind the curtains. So typically, ethics is divided into sort of three main categories of thought. And those are virtue ethics, uh, deontology and utilitarianism. Um, I think utilitarianism is a very useful framework in the sense that 
whenever we're trying to change things in the world, we're trying to have impact. And the more impact we can have, the better. So to the extent that utilitarianism tries to track impact, it's the most useful framework. I think the other frameworks are also useful, in, and I don't think they're um, exclusive of one another. I think they have, we can see them as having different rules. So deontology is about rules, and I don't, I don't like to think in terms of duty or obligation. I, I, I think those are, I wouldn't say that they're, they're empty concepts, but I don't think they have the absoluteness that we might think. Um, I think it's more that we would like people to feel a duty or a responsibility. I don't think it, it exists in some kind of absolute sense. But the very notion of rules can be very useful. When we follow rules, we tend to, if the rules are well designed, we'll be more effective at having impact. And virtue ethics, well, you know, if we think of it, if we think of the purpose of ethics as just being a good person for its own sake, then I don't think, I don't think that's a very, that's necessarily a very modern, useful approach, unless being a good person means trying to address suffering, trying to have impact in the world. It's not just about being good in a sort of superficial way, but actually caring, being compassionate and trying to alleviate suffering. So when the focus is on suffering, then these three frameworks um, are, all, are all relevant or all have a different, or all have a, a role to play. In fact, I wrote, in, I only have two paragraphs devoted to virtue ethics in my um, new book, but I do say that to the extent that um, the key to a more compassionate world is by promoting compassion um, and, and trying to ensure that people value the prevention of suffering, virtue ethics can be seen as even the key to a better world. But if we look at utilitarianism in particular, um, the classical utilitarianism is, it values happiness in the same way that it just values suffering. And as I've argued in my book and in uh, the talk I gave this morning, I don't think that this adding together or aggregation, as it's called, of very different experiences is, is valid. Um, that applies to both the idea that we can balance out somehow in some very numerical way suffering with happiness, but it also means that I don't think we can add together extreme suffering and much more minor suffering um, because they are very different experiences, not just quantitatively, but qualitatively. Um, so I think what, what's happening there is that our intuitions get in the way. Uh, we like to think that because happiness and suffering are in our minds polar opposites, that they can actually also numerically cancel each other out. And this is a point I'm arguing strongly against. I also think that suffering is fundamentally different from happiness in that when there's suffering, there's this inherent need to do something about it. Whereas happiness doesn't, there's no issue with happiness when it exists, but also there's no need, there's no call to action to bring it into existence um, out of nothingness. So that's where the fundamental asymmetry lies. And you know, the, the focus on suffering uh, as opposed to happiness is, has traditionally be, been called negative utilitarianism. And I, I didn't mention this in my talk, but um, it's been criticized for a couple of reasons. The idea that, um, in theory, it would mean that we could care about pinpricks and very minor pains um, and ignore happiness. And that's just, that's not why people care about suffering. It's not because they care about pinpricks, but because they care about really severe suffering. So it's sort of, these kinds of arguments are a bit of a distraction. There's also, you know, um, there's also this end of the world argument, the idea that, you know, if we really only care about suffering, then we might as just as well just try to destroy the world. And that doesn't take into account all of the very strong intuitions that we have about trying to preserve our own existence. Um, I would just add as well that I, I didn't talk about this in my talk, but I don't consider myself technically a moral realist. I, I don't think in terms of should and ought. And so even if we thought that in theory, negative utilitarianism would mean that we have to go down this road of of um, self-destruction, um, there's no there's no ought there. There's no, there's no imperative to do that, and it would be it would be actually a pretty ridiculous route to take because uh, 
we'd be going against our strongest intuitions and all the people around us. So, you know, in practice, I think the framework that I, I propose, which I call XNU+, um, which is the focus on extreme suffering, but taking into account our intuitions, is a very realistic one. It allows us to maintain our compassion towards all sentient beings, but within a framework where we also respect our intuitions and our own desires to thrive and enjoy life and derive meaning from it. Just not trying to justify the, um, the suffering with any amount of, of happiness, but basically just recognizing that there, there's, there's these two, um, these two, let's say, aspects of the framework exist on different levels. The one is this inherent need and the other one is a response to our intuitions.